Welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. This is episode 337 with Eileen Day McCusick. Today's guest, Eileen Day McCusick, is a researcher, inventor, writer, educator, and practitioner who's been studying the effects of audible acoustic sound on the human body since 1996. She's the creator of a therapy method called biofield tuning that uses tuning forks to detect and correct distortion in the human biofield. She is the author of Tuning the Human Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy, and the recent book, Electric Body, Electric Health. And before we recorded this episode, I wanted to experience biofield tuning. So I had a biofield tuning session with Eileen's chief international trainer, uh, Jessica Luebrand, and it was incredible. It actually healed my left hip, which had been sort of tight and popping for many years and hasn't done that since. And the amazing thing was that it was totally remotely. I was in a completely different state when I had the session. So you're going to hear Eileen explain how can these sessions be done even when you're not in person. And one thing that Eileen is really good at is because she's such a natural skeptic herself. If you take something like the human biofield and standing waves of biophotons and the electromagnetic view of the universe and electromagnetic view of biology, all these things are just beginning to be studied more in science. So in order to bring all these phenomenon that she's observing and studying and proving that they're actually working on people, in order to bring them out of the woo-woo, she had to get really good and concrete with how she speaks about them. So you will learn a ton because her explanations are so dialed in on all this stuff that probably you you never really were able to conceptualize before. I certainly wasn't. Many of these things that sort of innately you you know are probably true, but there's no good languaging for it. So she's a great communicator and storyteller. And what I love about this episode is that it represents another step forward in a tool that we can use to understand the universe, to understand our own emotions and our connection together as humans, but a modality as well that we can use to heal ourselves, to increase our performance. This is something that you definitely are going to want to go and try and check out for yourself. I've even recommended it to my own family, and they're starting to get biofield sessions. And Eileen herself is just such a fantastic, curious explorer that that is why this biofield, this whole field of biofield tuning was was discovered in the first place. So I think you're going to love Eileen just as much as I do. Uh, so without further ado, here she is. Eileen Cusick, welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm very, very excited. I've been, uh, been looking forward to this for a few weeks, read your book, and um, had a chance to have a session with one of your uh, sort of chief collaborators. And we're going to be talking about biofield tuning and your new book, Electric Body, Electric Health. And let's let's just start with sort of a broad definition of how, uh, how you describe um, what you do and, and in particular, what is, what is biofield tuning? Derek? Oh, you froze. We had, we had a froze. We had a freeze. <laughs> yeah. Internet no, connection is unstable. Hmm. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's try that again and cross our fingers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just take it from the top again. Eileen McCusick, welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me. Hi. Yeah. And um, let's start with what what it is that you do. We're going to talk about your work, biofield tuning. We're going to talk about your new book, um, but we'd love to hear from you how you describe it to people. Well, I would say first and foremost, I'm a health and human potential researcher. I've been studying that field since I was 18 years old, back in 1987. I took a real interest in what does it mean to be human and what is how can we reach our potential as humans? 
So that that's my the overarching kind of field of study is really health. And my research journey led me to sound in 1996. And I started reading books about the use of vibrational medicine, color, sound, music, and healing. And this was on the heels of sort of discovering that everything is vibration, that solid reality, this billiard ball reality that we've been conditioned to believe in doesn't really exist, that solidness is an artifact of human perception and that ultimately <clears throat> everything is just waves in space. And, uh, and so if I'm just waves in space, then treating me with vibration seemed like a very logical and elegant thing to do. And <clears throat> I read as many books as I could find at the time. And then I found a set of tuning forks for healing in a catalog as soon as I finished my stack of books. So I ordered them. And at the time I had a part-time massage therapy practice. So I had some clients that I felt comfortable enough with to experiment on and turn them into guinea pigs. And I started making really weird discoveries with the tuning forks, things that I really didn't expect at all. The set that I had was the C major scale and I thought that if you activated a tuning fork and the note of C and you held it over someone, it was going to sound like a C, you know, it was just going to be an input. But what I discovered was that it was actually a conversation between the subtle sounds being produced by the tuning fork. You have your fundamental, but then technically tuning forks produce an infinite number of overtones and undertones. Everything in the body's in motion and everything in motion makes waves, waves propagate. And those propagating waves ended up, I discovered, uh, have a conversation with the tuning, the sounds produced by the tuning forks. And so the sound of the fork will change as you move it around the body and you hold it over different areas. And so, you know, I started discovering that. I started discovering that if someone was in pain, the fork would sound sharp over the area where they had pain. And if I just kept holding it there and introducing it to the body and giving the body that kind of that feedback, it's basically like, hey, body, you sound pretty sharp over here. And the body would go, whoa, I sound really sharp. And it would use that feedback loop to actually tune itself. And after just a little bit, it wouldn't sound sharp anymore. It would sound, you know, like it's supposed to. And then the person on the table would be like, wow, all my pain is gone. <laughs> like, how did that happen? And so I discovered kind of early on that our human bodies were acoustic electric instruments and were basically self-tuning when exposed to a coherent input for the right amount of time in the right place, our body will bring itself into a greater degree of order and harmony. And so for the last 25 years now, um, I've been using the tuning forks to do just that, to help people to bring themselves back in tune. And it's a wonderfully simple and elegant way uh, to induce coherence into all the systems of the body, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. Yeah. Wow. And, and so um, that moment when you sort of first used a tuning fork and you, uh, you, you had to be sort of paying attention, you had to be sort of listening. There's, there's some amount of, um, I don't know, were you, were you looking for something or, or how did, how did you actually first realize that the tuning fork had different uh, sort of sounds in, in different situations. And so all I did was pay attention. You know, I, I think that's um, one of the things that I've noticed about myself is that I tend to listen more deeply and kind of pay attention a, a little more acutely than, than a lot of people. And what I did was I paid very close attention for a number of years. And I actually discovered that the well, first of all, I discovered that our body has an electrical system in its entirety that we never talk about and that we never learn about. And then I discovered that not only is the body electric, but that our entire environment is as well. And so that, that was a revelation, you know, just coming to see and understand that. Anything that has an electric current running through it, like the human body does, has a magnetic field around it. And so that's what I ended up kind of became my area of research sort of accidentally, you know, I sort of accidentally discovered this tonal landscape around the body and observed all these patterns in it. And 
that turned into what I call the biofield anatomy and my biofield anatomy hypothesis that basically all of our memories are stored in our body's electrical system. And if you think about it, everything that we see, hear, touch, taste, feel, everything that we experience is translated into an electromagnetic signal in the body. Therefore, it makes sense that all our memories are stored in our body's electrical system. And we know that information can be stored and carried on standing waves. So the biofield anatomy hypothesis states that the body's electrical system is essentially toroidal in structure and that our memories are stored in standing waves in the field around our body. And I have mapped this field and I've discovered that specific memories reside in very specific places. So just like they've mapped the brain and figured out the different parts of the brain do different things, I've mapped the field and discovered a very specific anatomy and physiology. So if you had a traumatic experience at age three related to your father, I would know exactly where to find that in your field. I could stick a fork in it and I can listen to the vibrational information and tell you about your father, his personality, the interaction, how it affected you going forward. It's all stored uh, in this vibrational patterning in a very specific language that I've decoded. Every emotion produces a very specific frequency signature and resides in a very specific area within the biofield storage system. And that's something that I had never encountered before and, and sort of seeing uh, that you, you have a map, you could even, I think on your website, you can buy sort of like a wall map, like you could buy a map of the earth. Um, and it shows, you know, like here and it's, you know, certain inches or feet out from the body. And my understanding is, um, you know, the farther you get out towards the edge of sort of someone's field, uh, that's the younger age that they would have experienced something. The, the idea of memories stored external to the body was something totally new for me and, and that you have a map uh, that you, you can even buy a map and put it on your wall uh, and you can place those different things. That is that was, it, it pretty much blew my mind to, to, to see that. And it's um, so, uh, almost like, so your, your memories are not in your brain in some sense. They're in a standing field. Uh, what is the, so a standing wave of, a wave of what? What is it that we're talking about? Well, we're talking about electromagnetic information. We're talking about phonons and photons, basically sound and light. Uh, you know, vibrational information across a broad spectrum of frequencies and amplitudes. So let's, um, so we, I, I kind of want to understand um, the, because one of the paradigms that you're really shifting is sort of this sort of mechanical, chemical, um, biological thinking about the body and, and thinking about it instead in electric, but we're also talking about photons. Uh, here as well. So maybe you could touch on um, how, how photons and electric, how, how are they connected in this sense? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. And it's something that I don't think that we really fully understand when we talk about things like electricity, when we talk about light, when we talk about sound, I think that our understanding is really limited. You know, just for example, when it comes to sound, we're told that sound is a longitudinal wave. But whenever we see a sound wave depicted, it's depicted as a transverse wave. Like, what's up with that? Why does nobody ever kind of call that out? I mean, my observation with waves is that they all have both transverse and longitudinal properties. So light being no, no different, it has transverse and longitudinal properties basically came to the conclusion that really everything, whether we call it sound, and that's a tricky word because it has a couple different definitions. One definition of sound is frequency in the range of human hearing, which is about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Another definition of sound is propagated frequent waves of any frequency, of any frequency. So there's a, there's a Vedic saying, not a Brahma, all is sound. And you could say every, basically what everything is, is, is vibrations in the ether. 
fluctuations in the ether. The, so whether it's math, whether it's music, whether it's electricity, whether it's sound, whether it's light, regardless of what we call any of it, it's all movement through the, the basic fabric of life. You know what, I, I use the term ether, but people use other terms for that. The, the concept of ether is one of the things that makes what I do difficult to understand because most people are only educated into a cosmology that includes solid, liquid, and gas. But through my own research and discovery and curiosity, I discovered there are two additional states of matter, plasma and ether. And most of us don't learn too much about plasma, but most of us have heard that ether has been debunked, which is simply not true. You know, this is simply not true. <laughs> You know, the, nobody ever wants to talk to me about business because there's all kinds of other things that we can talk about. But I actually have quite a lot to say, you know, around building an organization and uh, how you have how everything that works for you being a one man band, like you works against you when you have an organization and you have to completely delete your old personality and recreate a new one that works, you know, in teams and um, and how like we've gotten rid of the pyramid structure altogether. And we're looking at things more from like a level playing field, team-based positions, not promotions, you know, mm. your points of contact. Um, I want to create like a living 3D honeycomb project-based business structure instead of this stupid frozen pyramid. When I got stuck up in the top of the pyramid, people felt like they couldn't reach out to me. I was like, this sucks. Like I'm a people person. And now I've got only two people that report to me. Like, no, <laughs> I drew a wheel. I'm like, these 12 people are all people that I'm in contact with. Like we're putting this all on the level ground and working that way, um, which is much better. Like corporate hierarchy structure is dead. Mm. <laughs> when when I was um, I was chatting with your friend Jessica Lewebrand, she gave me a session before we did this interview, and she said she thought of you um, as as a really creative experimenter, um, and you know you were talking about your ability to sort of pay pay close attention, which is which is why you were able to sort of make these discoveries, and um, you know hearing you just say a honeycomb business structure that's that's very um, outside the box thinking as well. So, you know, it sounds like you have these different identities, um, but in each one, you're sort of bringing outside the box thinking to some degree. Um, is, that, is that intentional? T tell me about how you're able to, to, to do that. I think that, uh, you know, I think we know that kids and animals have really good bullshit meters, right? Mine never got disabled. You know, most of most people's bullshit meter gets disabled and we're told lies and nonsense and bullshit. And we just stop trusting ourselves and our own perception of the resonance and ring of truth. So I'm really willing to question like everyone and everything. It used to drive my mom crazy. You know, she'd be like, you can't tell that child anything. She's got to figure it out for herself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very skeptical by nature. I'm very, very skeptical. And everything that I look at, I'm always looking at how can this be done better? How can this be more efficient? How can this be reinvented in such a way that it takes less time and costs less money? I'm, my mind is always geared towards looking for the simplest, easiest, most direct solution. Most people's minds don't actually work that way. You know, I've taught many, many students over the years. And it's really obvious to me that many people make their lives more complicated and difficult than they need to. And as a consequence, they don't really get very far. My obsession with efficiency has enabled me to cover a lot of ground in a lot of different ways. It's funny you say that. Um, I think we may be similar in that way. Well, I, I had this, this job, I was working as a lab tech and it was, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a big picture thinker uh, like you and, uh, just really was failing at that, but I ended up sort of systematizing the whole lab, making the whole thing more efficient and accidentally, um, you know, bringing in lots of money from customers. Whenever I had the chance to talk to them, uh, they would be like, Oh, let's do this new, um, sort of a round of testing or experiments that, that we hadn't thought of. Um, but when I was in that sort of constraints of like, you just have to be productive, you just have to sort of follow these 
rules. Uh, it was, it was very stifling. So it sounds like, um, it may, we know you and I are maybe big picture thinkers. In yeah, that sense. definitely. You know, one of the, one of my hats, I call myself a cosmological storyteller because I'm one of those people who's always stepping back and winding the lens and winding the lens and winding the lens. And that turns you into a cosmologist where you're taking in, you know, the super big picture and cosmology spans all of the disciplines. So, you know, there's a, a just a, a tendency on my part because I love information and I absorb and process information very quickly, you know, so ever since I was a kid and just like constantly sucking up information and synthesizing that, you know, and, and you probably discovered reading Electric Body, Electric Health, that it's the synthesis of a lot of information across a number of different disciplines. And so, um, you know, it just gives me the opportunity to uh, just look at things in a different way from most people, partly because I have absorbed so much information from so many different sources that I, I, I'm bringing a fresh perspective to everything that I look at, and, you know, and, and is it working? Is it effective? Is it not effective? How can things be more effective? Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say is that because you're sort of, you're, you're sort of broadly educated, um, broadly informed, you're able to see where the cutting edge is. You're able to see sort of where here's the limits of what we know and here's what we might do to sort of push that. Yeah, I love the edge. <laughs> I imagine that you you deal with skeptics often, and it's interesting to hear you say that you are a skeptical person. Um, so it seems like a skeptical person is a great person to sort of address the the doubts of uh, skeptics. Um, how do you what what type of skepticism do you most encounter uh, when you're sort of talking? To, to people about your work for the first time? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Derek, I don't think I've encountered skepticism for a long time now, quite mm. frankly. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think that I've gotten so good at this point of making it so down to earth and so real. And, you know, because in the beginning, it was really mortifying. You know, and I always tell people that I was using teeny forks for healing in their energy field, and they'd be like, okay, you know. <laughs> Like it was, it was embarrassing and people were unkind and skeptical and uh, rude even, which made me really determined to figure it out because I knew that whatever was happening, it was producing the kinds of outcomes that people are looking for. It was getting people out of pain, out of depression, out of anxiety, stopping them from feeling stuck, improving their digestion. We, you know, it was... I didn't even know what I was doing and I was healing people with sound and, and I knew that there, you know, th there's a lot of suffering in the world. There's a lot of people looking for solutions. There's a lot of promises out there that don't, you know, deliver necessarily. And that this, in this very non-invasive, very elegant way was helping people. And so I felt kind of like a moral obligation to bring it out into the world but it was embarrassing, you know, it was, it really was. I'm like, really, I was like, you know, source kind of made it clear to me that that was my job. And my job was to, you know, to explore and understand the biofield and therapeutic sound, get degrees um, and to, to be involved in moving the whole science of the biofield forward. And, and I was like, tuning forks? Like, you want me to go out and talk about tuning forks? Like, really? You know, somebody said to me once, you know, of all the woo-woo stuff that's out there, what you come, what you do comes across as the most woo-woo. And I was mortified. I was like, I'm the most logical, grounded, like left brain woman I know. You know, I am not a purple wearing, crystal packing, <laughs> new age person and I really resent being seen that way and classified that way. So I worked very, very hard to educate myself to understand the science, you know, to really get what was going on and to be able to uh, describe to people in ways that they resonate with and that they understand. You know, basically what most people, just about everybody says when they encounter my work is really simple. They say, this makes sense, it just does. It just makes sense. And it makes sense in so much, you know, 
so many levels. And, and I think as time has evolved, you know, the climate of 2021 is really different than the climate of 1996. Mm, sure. Very, very different mindset now. You know, 96 people were like, sound healing? I've never heard of that. <laughs> now pretty much everybody's heard of, you know, bowl baths and things like that. Like people have heard of sound healing now, but in 96, nobody really had. So, you know, so just the, the collective is more primed for this kind of information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's other things I talk about, like music, you know, everybody, almost everybody I know has a musical playlist and selectively uses music to suit or shift their mood. And we all know that sound has the power to move us emotionally. And we're yeah. all singulars in our own right, you know? Uh, so, so we, we have a, a piano, an old piano. We, we bought this house a year ago and our neighbors uh, gave us a piano and it, it's so huge. Um, but it was made in 1904 and it has a tuning of 440 instead of 444 or whatever the like current concert tuning is. And so it sounds, it sounds different. It's like, uh, or 442, whatever this sort of. Uh, 432 to 432. Con current current uh, concert pitch is A440. Previous to the 50s, everything was in 432. Right. Um, so I, that, that sort of was interesting to me um, that we happened to get this sort of piano that, uh, as I've heard, 432 is supposed to be like a frequency that's really good for people as well. I, I, on YouTube, there's like, it says like 432 healing hurts playlist or something could you what is what is the difference between these uh different frequencies well first of all um i'm not i'm not a musician okay i'm a sound therapist and i do not use 432 hertz as a frequency okay so i'm mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not an authority on this subject i can speak to it as a sound researcher uh and actually for the very first time i did have the experience of playing and singing to 432 versus 440 just a few weeks ago so hmm. i i have finally had, i can speak from personal experience that when we had previously done this music in 440 when we were done we felt kind of energized but sort of jacked up and when we did the same exercise in 432 we felt more calm and settled okay so the the example hmm. that i give regarding 432 and 440 there's a big conversation we can have here about the naturalness of the number 432 and how it shows up you know numerologically and cosmologically all over the place and right that's not my wheelhouse i've certainly read about it but i can't speak very eloquently about all <laughs> the, the wonders of 432 um mathematically <clears throat> but if you go to youtube and you look at a cymatic image of 440 hertz versus a cymatic image of 432 hertz, you'll see the difference. 440 looks kind of like, uh, and 432 just looks a lot more chill and coherent. Interesting. Yeah. And that was my experience with the music. Like my, remember, we're mostly water and sound waves absolutely inform us. John Stuart Reed made a device called a cymoscope that visualizes sound waves in a dish of water and films them. And it really gives you this idea of like, wow, I'm mostly water. And when I'm subjecting myself to waves, it's creating this pattern of information in me. So 440 in water is kind of fuzzy and 432 is much more coherent and clear. So it's going to inform you into a greater state of clarity and coherence. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stories about why 440 was chosen. Um, you know, some of them being kind of conspiracy theory oriented, uh, but a lot of people are starting to reorient back to 432. Interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks for commenting on that. And, um, you know, I know you started with a C fork and now you've sort of created your own forks um, and you're using, a, one was really cool, the, the Fibonacci pair that I saw on your website. Um, and you've, you've got another fork, the, the Sonic slider. And it sounds like, so you're using different uh, Hertz frequency forks. Um, 
how did you how did you arrive at the ones you're using today? Well, the Sonic Slider is a kind of a unique fork. I had wanted to create something for facial relaxation and rejuvenation, and I uh, noodled around with numbers. You know, I, I like to play just as a researcher, you know, I like to think about different numbers, uh, sacred geometry numbers, numbers related to natural ratios and that sort of thing. And so I came up with five different prototypes that I thought might be useful for that application. And when I got them and I went through them all, I knew the moment that I activated the 93.96 Hertz fork that it was exactly the vibe that I was looking for. It's the 12th harmonic of the average frequency of the Schumann resonance. So the Schumann resonance is the Earth's electrical background sort of radiant pulse that's going on continuously, the flow of energy from the surface of the Earth to the ionosphere back again, all the electrical activity that's taking place creates this sort of continual rhythm that is present in the ionospheric cavity of around 7.83 Hertz. So 7.83 times 12 is 93.96 hertz and that particular frequency because it you can't make a tuning fork that's 7.83 hertz it would be like five feet long you know <laughs> not, but you can embed that familiar frequency within the, the harmonics the mathematics of um, the multiples of it and so uh, the sonic slider uh, when you use it it induces that information of the earth's natural electric rhythm into our bodies, you know, and that's your brain in a sort of alpha, low alpha state of just present aware connection, you know, with life itself. All, all of life is electrical, the earth is electrical, our environment is electrical, our bodies are electrical, and everything is in rhythm in the universe. And, you know, humans have gotten really out of tune and really out of rhythm. And we can bring ourselves back in a tune and back in a rhythm, back into this sort of cosmic order of harmony and flow. Like it exists as a potential inside all of us in every moment. But most people are trapped in their surface waves of noise, static, drama, struggle, self-esteem beliefs, stories. You know, there, there, there are people who are up in the surface of noise in what Eckhart Tolle calls our pain body and self-referring to their pain body, their struggles, their wounds, and that sort of thing, especially their limitations. Um, when underneath there is this beautiful harmony that's completely connected to the cosmos and has never disconnected from it. I, I, wanna, I wanna follow up on that, but first I, I'm still curious about the, um, the five prototypes. Were they just different, different um, uh, harmonics of the Schumann resonance or, or were they not all, you know? No, no, that was the only harmonic of the Schumann resonance. There were other, there are other ones. I don't recall now, you know, that was a few years ago. I don't, I don't even know where those prototypes went. I was like not interested in any of the other ones after feeling this one. I did try to create a partner to it because I like to use forks together to create a binaural beat. Mm -hmm. And so I tried, um, I had a prototype made of the 11th harmonic and the 13th harmonic. And it was kind of like a Goldilocks and the three bears kind of thing. The 11th harmonic was deadening when I used it on people and just knocked them out. Just like, huh. And the 13th harmonic was like neurotic and high strung and it made you feel kind of whacked out. Whereas, you know, the 12th harmonic is like just right. And so I never could create, I was going to create like a slider sister <laughs> to use in a pair, but the harmonics on either side were completely unusable. And so what I ended up doing was digging out the Fibonacci pair that I'd actually invented the year before. I'm always kind of inventing things and sort of leaving a trail behind me and some things I like keep moving along with. And th these are so actually such cool forks. They're 89 and 144 Hertz. They're the 11th and 12th position in the Fibonacci sequence. So they create a binaural beat of with the information of phi, the golden ratio, the golden mean, harmony, order, beauty, truth. And they, when used together, they inform the etheric template of our bodies with the information of order. Uh, this that's really cool. Let, I, let's uh, let's go down this rabbit hole for a second. So first, let me show you. I have the um, the Fibonacci tattoo, 
And uh, I ha I'm working with this, this idea, this theory uh, about frames of thinking and how um, we could potentially shift into, like right now we're thinking inside of a box. And I think it's partly because of our mathematics base 10 system, which leads to houses that can, are constructed like boxes and rectangles and so many things are boxed in. But when you shift to sort of thinking in a, a sort of a spiraling manner, it's much more biological and this is more like the universe. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's nearly impossible to start thinking inside of a Fibonacci frame of mind. But um, one example is um, I just put these, uh, I have a bicycle and I just put these sort of spiral ovalized chain rings on and it feels when you're pedaling, it feels so much more congruent, I guess I could say. So uh, I'm just kind of, kind of putting, this, putting this out there of uh, could your Fibonacci tuning forks be sort of helping us get into sort of a frame of reference that's much more sort of natural and biological than the sort of the boxed in way of thinking that's driven by our uh, mathematics that we sort of that shape our world. Yes. I, I mean, you know, everything in nature spirals, right? When we were talking about the nature of waves earlier, you know, again, when, when it comes down to understanding sound or understanding light, uh, actually, you know, what sound and light both propagate spherically and spirally from their origin, their points of origin. That, that sound is a complex geometric information that is spiraling. So, you know, like longitudinal wave, transverse wave, it's so much more than that, right? It's so much more than that. Um, everything is. And so, as far as like our, our Fibonacci nature, uh, the spiraling nature of life, blood spirals through our veins, you know, everything, mm -hmm. everything spirals. And so, yeah, you know, what is it? One of the great Native American leaders said, uh, there can be no power in a square. And, and the idea that, you know, that, that, circles or all the world's a circle. Actually, uh, Victor Schauberger, I don't know if you're familiar with his work at all. He was an Austrian park ranger who studied, who was very curious and studied water very closely. And he observed that water in nature traveled in these spiral pathways. And he made a bet with some people that uh, water would travel faster down a spiral pipe than it would down a straight pipe. And mm -hmm. they were like, nonsense <laughs> and it did it came out the spiral path faster because that's the natural way that that water moves isn't that cool yeah i mean i guess we all see that when we flush our toilets exactly um, yeah wow hmm um gosh there's so, there's so many cool things uh what one thing um i can't remember exactly we put a bookmark in something that i was going to follow up on but can't remember that right now. So um, are there limits to what biofield tuning can address? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I think that we haven't necessarily had the opportunity to really clarify for your listeners exactly what biofield tuning is, right? Okay, we, perfect. Yeah, let's... We've talked about the biofield and we've talked about, you know, oh, mean making discoveries with sound you know, that the body's a tuning instrument. But, but basically what a biofield tuning session entails is having your electrical system groomed with a tuning fork, basically. Um, I, you know, if I were to do a session on you, you would lie down on a treatment table fully clothed and I'd uh, activate some points on your body. I use weighted tuning forks, the kinds with the barrels on the end. I got made these little boot attachments to go onto them. I use them kind of like a stethoscope. I uh, will activate them, put them on your body. We're sending sound into your body, but I have such a deep understanding of the vibrational language of, of the body that I can read many, many things just by sounding into your tissues and feeling the information that comes back. It's not so different than Chinese pulse diagnosis, you know, both, both with the work on the body and in listening to the field. We're just listening to the different systems and flows and things that are going on. 
So then I'm going to uh, determine, you know, let's just say your right hip is hurting. So I'm going to go out to the edge of your biofield, which I'm going to find around six feet away from your body. We see the biofield as a torus that has, which is basically a, a bubble with a central channel, a channel down the middle and a boundary. So I think oftentimes when people think of auras or energy fields, they think of something that's sort of diffused and sort of diffuses out. The biofield isn't like that. It actually has a boundary like a bubble. And, um, and this is, you know, what holds our standing waves. Fractally, it's the same idea as the magnetosphere of the earth or the heliosphere of the sun, that electrical structures um, form these magnetic bubbles around them that are bounded with double layer plasma membranes. And so our human biofield is no different. And it's this boundary, just like the Earth's ionosphere traps radio waves and traps the Schumann resonance, our own boundary of our biofield creates the standing waves in our field. So I'll start at the edge of your field about six feet away. That's gonna give me the information of gestation and then birth. And then it's like dropping a needle on an album and reading the vibrational record of your life. As I move through your field, the fork is gonna change in pitch and volume and timbre and the sound that it's making. And I'm also going to have the experience of encountering resistance, which is a very odd phenomenon when you're moving a tuning fork slowly through space to actually all of a sudden feel like you are electromagnetically stopped mm. in a certain zone. We get stopped in memories that were chaotic, that were traumatic, where you had inputs and experiences that made the needle that's recording the whole record of your life experience go all over the place. And that, and very often in a traumatic situation, we hold our breath, we contract. And so the information of that experience and that memory is held in that specific area. So we might get to be around 10 and it's all snarled up. And I was like, wow, you know, what happened? When you're 10 and you're like, oh God, that's when we moved and and, and I'll be like, wow. And you really, it was really hard for you. And you'd be like, yeah, man, that was a really tough time. And so we just kind of hang out and you might notice that you've got, you know, wow, I'm actually feeling pain in my like left, in my right glute while you're in that area. And then all of a sudden, like you'll, that muscle will let go and the resistance in the field will let go and you'll take a big breath and you'll be like, wow, I didn't even know I was holding that tension that I've been holding that tension since I was 10 years old. And now I just let it go. And now all of a sudden there's breath and energy and movement particularly this part of me that there just wasn't. And so I will go sort of systematically through your field, finding every place where there's resistance, where there's stuckness, where there's tension in the body. We'll just bring awareness to it. The body will use the sound to open up space. It's not so different than lithotripsy where they use sound to break up kidney stones. Mm. You, have a kidney stone, you have a wave front comes in and hits that kidney stone and it breaks it into smaller pieces. It opens up space between the molecules, which allows you to pass the kidney stone. The same principle, the sound is opening up space in the magnetic field, opening up space in the physical body, which then allows flow to take place, right? Health is a state of flow. So the more biofield tuning you receive, the more of these subconscious blockages that are creating tension and lack of flow in your body, which then leads to inflammation, and inflammation is precursor to disease, right? But that's all happening in the body's electrical system. So we can access the electrical system through the magnetic field. Magnetic fields guide electric currents. Tuning forks produce a small electromagnetic charge, which makes them act like a magnet. So we manipulate and modulate the magnetic field, which then changes the way electric current is flowing through the body. It's really, it's really simple. I mean, basically a body that is relaxed and breathing is going to take care of itself. It's fundamentally, it's tension and lack of breath that, that creates the whole cascade that leads to disease. It's really that simple. And so this process is really just one of systematically getting you to relax. The, one of the key points uh, there for me was uh, learning the tuning forks, create a magnet, and then you can sort of use that. Um, to, to move um, energy. Do, do actual magnets, uh, have you ever tried with, with magnets? Um, I, people do use magnets. You know, this, this is kind of like, uh, that goes back to Mesmer. People are familiar with Franz Anton Mesmer, 
who back in the 1700s was doing this with his hands. He was doing it with iron rods. You know, he called it animal magnetism. And, uh, and he was, um, you know, ended up being punished and derided as a fraud. But Mesmer was doing the exact same thing that I'm doing. You know, finding blocks in the magnetic field and figuring out different ways to get them to move. The body would then like have a healing crisis and as it would expel what had been held in the blueprint is no longer in the blueprint. Therefore the body goes, wow, we don't need this in the cells anymore because it's not in the blueprint. And it kind of kicks everything out into circulation and you, know, you have to deal with it. You have a healing crisis, but you know, and like what I said earlier, when we were off air was no different than shamans beating drums or shaking rattles around the body. It's manipulating the magnetic field in order to shift the way that electricity, the story, is happening in the body and in the mind. You now people get stuck in patterns of dysfunction. It can be just set back into motion. You know, you're like, this is just waves in space, dude. You don't need to be attached to it. Like, let's go into <laughs> okay. what what implications, if any, are there for when you're out in public and you have a field that's around you and then you're in a tight space with other people and your sort of field bubbles are then overlapping, right? So you have maybe some standing waves and they have some standing waves and then they're sort of passing through each other, perhaps like what do you, can you talk about that? I mean, we absolutely feel each other's vibes. You know, a lot of things, um, there's a lot of things that we're not told about our biology. And here's one of them that I think blew my mind when I first came across it. I, it came from Bruce Lipton in the book, The Biology of Belief that that was the first place I was exposed to it. <laughs> it's like paradigm busting, this little fact alone. We got all taught that the way that cellular communication happens in our body is through this lock and key chemical thing of like chemicals getting in and out of cells. Every single cell membrane has little antennas on it called primary cilia that house structures called microtubules that are antenna that are constantly sensing into the vibrational information that's being sent from the cells around it and the rest of the body and the environment as well. Not only is it receiving information, but it is continually transmitting information as well. Everything that's happening in our body is happening through light transmission and information. It's not happening through the super slow chemical thing. Like, yeah, that's part of what goes on, but the bulk of what is happening, if you look at any high level athlete and the way that their body is moving, there's no, it has to be faster than light speed. So that's, what's really going on is this vibrational communication system. And it's through these, these little primary cilia, you know, that, that we, that I sense your vibes, you know, I can tell from across the room, whether I dig you or whether I don't just by, you know, your vibe. And if I'm, I'm hanging out with, with somebody, like I was with a friend the other day who's having a really hard time and they were kind of like losing it and, and yelling, right? And I'm in their space. And, and I wanted to let them vent because they needed to. Um, but by the end of it, I had a stomach ache. <laughs> it's mm. like, that hurt, right? Because all of that really strong energy is coming into my body. My, my little antennas are like doing this, like you're not really wanting me to see. Right? So I went into a state of tension. Imagine if you grew up around a dad who's an alcoholic or a rageaholic who was like always yelling like that, you know, what's going to happen to all your little antenna? I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to do this. They're going to yeah. bump up and pull in. And then your bandwidth of perception is going to be way less than it actually has the potential to be. I really noticed that I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old kid. And when they're even just enjoying themselves, but screaming a lot, I notice how it's just changing my own field, I suppose. Uh, and it's just, it just it gets to a point where you're like, okay, I'm full. Um, that's too much. I have to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So just a little bit more about influence, you know, again, um, cause we're taught into this like chemical mechanical way. We talk about being attracted to people's, um, pheromones or, you know, the chemistry, but what's really going on on a more fundamental level is electromagnetism. We are electromagnetically attracted to, or repelled by people. You can tell again from across the room before the pheromones even hit your nose, whether you're experiencing in a sense of attraction or repulsion to something. And that's all happening through electromagnetic field interactions. It's how we sense each other's vibe, how we can know within just a few matter, you know, just a few minutes of meeting, whether we are resonant or not, because we are sensing into each other's vibes through magnetic field interactions. Yeah, I, I, the statistic I remember is something like uh, 
ninety-seven percent of the time, our first, people stick with their first impressions of someone. Um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's interesting to think that we're perceiving it not just on like looking at somebody, but through their through their field. And uh, so this let's let's transition into uh, these sessions can be done remotely. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to be in the room or have them on the table in front of you. Can you talk about why that works? Well, you know, I had an interesting experience a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I have two boys who are 20 and 23, and they put on some music. They were looking for a particular song, but what they ended up with, what, what ended up coming through the speakers was an audience recording of a Grateful Dead show from the 70s. And the soundtrack, like the sound quality was really poor, but I immediately felt my body and my field respond to the spirit of the music. Like I immediately got caught up in the vibe of the show and I and my, my body just started like being like, yeah, right? I could feel the groove. So even though that show was recorded in the 70s and I wasn't there and the sound quality wasn't even that great, my spirit was still moved by that sound. Okay. So okay. I do these, you know, a lot of what I do, what's available at my website is recordings of something like I did a biofield tuning session three years ago. You know, you weren't there when it happened. How the heck is it going to move you? Well, sound moves us. And when, when sound has intention behind it, it moves us even more. So, so that's, that's one thing, you know, if, it's just the fact that we're moved by sound and we know that, okay? Uh, but you and I could do a distant session without you even hearing it and it could still be effective. Yeah. So what's going on there? Right? How did? How the heck does that work? I mean, I just want you to know that people ask me for years. They're like, "Can you do this at a distance?" And I was like, "No, like, no. What a stupid question! I can't even believe you're asking me that." You know, I was very arrogant about it, about the no. Hmm. Um, so somebody actually convinced me to try one, <laughs> and then I did it. And and so you know that same pattern of information that I can find around your body, I can tell you your whole life story. I mean, I, I can you know, there's no secrets when it comes to me poking around in your field. I read everything. Like you can't hide anything. It's all it's right. A, there. It's a little intimidating. I mean, I'm kind. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know, when it comes right down to it, like, do you really want to heal? Like, confession is good for the soul. I'm the, some of the most profound healings that I've worked with are people who've said to me. I've never told anyone this before. I'm like, well, your body is telling it to me right now. Mm. You know, the reason why you've had this excruciating pain in your pelvis for 30 years is because your uncle raped you when you were 10 and you never told anybody. Now you've been carrying around that pain and that shame and that suffering. And you know what? Your body is really clear to me what is going on here. And simply by allowing those shameful things to be witnessed non judgmentally and with somebody who with an you know, an open, caring countenance to just witness you refeeling that again and releasing it is one of the most healing things that can happen to people. You know, confession is good for the soul. Your soul is your electric body. It is your electrical system. We have a soul and it is electric. And I'm so over like, the, the standard model telling us we have no soul, telling us there's no such thing as a field, you know, telling us like, like turning the energy and energy medicine into pseudoscience when it's just electricity. The electricity, the energy and energy medicine is electricity. I don't understand why, like more people haven't been like, why are you calling this pseudoscience? This is a perfectly logical explanation in understanding how electricity works. My hands are magnetic. I mean, I'm putting my hands on you. Electricity flows from an area of greater concentration to lesser concentration. If you're depleted and I'm great and I put my hands on you, you're gonna feel better. And that's just electric phenomenon. That is not pseudoscience, right? <laughs> so we've been living for decades with this demonization of energy medicine and, and things like vibrational medicine, and we're told it's hippie nonsense and all that. And it's just pure, clean science. That's all it is. And I, I also want to just sort of call out that uh, one of the hallmarks of science is, is being able to sort of change your mind with new evidence. And so you, you basically had this view 
can't do it remotely. And then finally you said, okay, we'll try it. Right. Experimental evidence says, okay, it does seem to work. Now yeah. you have to explain um, why it's working. So why is it working? Okay, well, so, so this brings us back to ether and, and you know, this idea of, of a, a unifying field that all life arises from. And part of the, the, part of the game here in this plane right now is that we're, most people are operating under the illusion of separation and the idea that I am separate from you and I am separate from nature and nature is separate from God and I am separate from God and we're all, you know, everything is separate in this billiard ball particle based clockwork landscape that is winding down due to the forces of entropy right and and that that worldview believes is told technically that the michelson morley experiment in 18 blah 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 proved that there's no ether that's just all a whole construct and a story like even einstein himself and then the other part of the story is, is that the ether if if ether exists, then that conflicts with relativity theory. And that most people believe that relativity theory took the place of ether and that space became an empty vacuum. We're told that light waves don't need a medium to travel through, that they can travel through nothingness, which is the most absurd statement imaginable. And yet people buy stuff like that hook, line, and sinker. Like, what do you mean waves travel through nothing? That's complete and utter nonsense. Like, Everything is movement through the luminiferous ocean of clear light that holds the potential for everything that ever is, was, or will ever be. These waves arise and come into being in the ether and then go back down, in, in, back into the pool of infinite potential. There's the explicate reality of everything we see and there's the implicate reality that's all within the fabric of the ether. The ether is all one thing. All of creation is all one thing. You know, we know oh, we can't reconcile the forces of nature and things don't behave. And the, we're told so much garbage and nonsense. It's so simple and so elegant and so connected. And they throw up all this smoke and mirrors and confusion to stop us from seeing the essential unity of all things. And so because it's all one thing, you know, this little bit of ether right here contains everything, information, everything that ever is, was, or will ever be is accessible right here. Also called the Akasha and the reading of the, of the reading of the Akashic records. So I can pluck the file that is you, Derek, out of the ether and I can put it on my table, like taking out a book at the library book or clicking on a Google doc. It's like you and I editing a Google doc, you know, you're wherever you are and I'm here, but we pulled up the same file and we're working on it together. That's the nature of the ether. It, it, it records every single keystroke of everything that ever is, you know, that ever was, is in the ether. And so through the medium, through resonance in the ether, I can read and modulate the file that is you and you can feel it and you can experience it. Now that's a hard stretch for a lot of people because it involves what, like a whole state of matter that I was told doesn't even exist. Right? So when people say, how does it work? I'm like, well, this is not the easiest question to answer because it, in, it requires you changing your cosmological story. Yeah, and, and so is it, is it simply our intention uh, that it's sort of the double click is allowing that access? Yeah, exactly. Like, and I don't even need to know, I don't need a picture of you. I don't need anything. I just, you know, like this is, and I, and I make it really simple. You know, I'm just like, this is Derek on the table. <laughs> I don't, I don't need anything. I, I, it would be helpful to know your age. Cause that way, when I go through and I hit places that are funky, I can be like, okay, this is this age. This is this age. Sometimes I can get a really clear, like, I've learned how to differentiate like, oh, that sounds like a car accident. That sounds like a heartbreak. And you know, there's, <laughs> there's definitely every, every kind of memory produces a kind of particular tone and we put words on everything, but really everything is simply a vibrational electrical experience. And the, the difference between the car accident and the heartbreak, uh, you learned just through your experimentation, but now you can teach it to people, right? Yes. And there's certain sounds that are really teachable. Um, 
there, you know, there's a really, there's really basic and it's kind of like music. Like if you and I are listening to a sad song, I don't need to look over at you and say, Hey Derek, this is a sad song. You're going to be like, duh. <laughs> sad song okay so it's kind of like that way with uh, music seeks to give expression to this fundamental vibrational language and so in the tuning forks like when i hit a pocket of sadness it sounds sad it, and there's all different iterations of sadness. I mean, there's many different kinds of sadness there's melancholy there's loneliness there's the sting of betrayal there's keening or wailing you know there's deep intense grief there's basic garden variety sadness i mean there's so many different subtle nuances in the way that these frequencies express right and i'm a writer too i love words and so for me it's been really fun to be like oh that sounds like you know <laughs> melancholy and mm. and really be able to, to tease out what these different expressions are. But sadness, this is a basic one, like you would know. Depression has an undertone. It makes me think of Eeyore. My kids used to have this little keyboard with different <laughs> characters from, um, from Winnie the Pooh and the Eeyore one went gray. <laughs> <laughs> That's how depression sounds. It's got this uh, kind of undertone and it lives in a very specific area off the left shoulder. Um, alarm, like if you were suddenly in a car accident or you're T-boned or you, you know, you just suddenly realize that your partner has been having an affair. There's a kind of like, ah! kind of, um, sharp, high kind of upgoing quality in the sound. Wow. Alarm. Um, that's pretty easy to identify. And um, so we're not talking about any positive emotions here. Is that because they just don't get stuck or they can't, there's no more waves of them? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, you know, uh, joy, um, anything like joy or uh, they all have, they all sound balanced. They all sound coherent. You know, what we're looking for is, is the noise in the signal. And, and once you resolve the noise out of the signal, like fear, for example, has a pulsing quality to it. It's, if you think of the Jaws soundtrack, it's got like the do 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 kind mm. of. Kind of quality so if somebody's afraid you know that that's happening that's pretty easy to identify um but the, these these uncomfortable feelings resolve into a more relaxed coherent expression fear resolves down into harmony you know anger resolves down into kind of acceptance um frustration uh also resolves into acceptance um you know, so so all of the uncomfortable emotions, when the when the body hears and feels them, it, it wants to resolve. The body is designed to run at like optimum efficiency. Our factory settings are everything in harmony, and every every system in rhythm and in tune with every other system. So that's how we're designed to run. Most people are running with this area flat, this area sharp, the rhythm of this organ's too fast, the you know, the rhythm of that organ's too slow. Like most people are just really out of tune and off rhythm, kind of all over the place, in a large part due to the inputs of their environment. You know, most people have grown up um, in pretty dissonant environments. Uh, I ask people like, how many of your parents modeled effective emotional management? Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody's ever raised their hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me read this quote, I think from, from your book um, that applies to what we're talking about. Disease is the last resort of suppressed emotion to have attention. Something I wrote down when I was uh, reading that book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I think what I found, and I, I was surprised to find this, it's something that we really talk about in our culture, but at the root of like every dysfunction and every disease that I've worked with is some kind of emotional mismanagement, some kind of emotional imbalance. Now, most of us are raised in this sort of absence only expectation of emotional expression in our homes. Right. And, you know, it's like, stop your nonsense. And that's kind of what you get, you know, in school and at home, many of us are just told to suppress our emotions. 
And so we've created an entire culture that's built on emotional suppression. You know, just feel the pain, just the, the, everything's fine, <laughs> you know? When meanwhile, we're, we're full of rage or full of grief or full of uh, self-loathing or um, guilt or shame, many people can't forgive themselves. It's a really big thing, you know, that I see people just have very unkind inner critics and they're always beating themselves up allowing a dialogue to go on in their head that they would never allow somebody outside their head to follow them around saying those things. <laughs> so there, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can become really energetically imbalanced inside because we've never been taught how to be any different. We've never been shown. How... Um... I mean, let's just say your average person, you know, we have these things, these unprocessed emotions we're carrying with us in our field. Uh, how, how many sessions, or can you do it in a session to sort of like bring all of them back into coherence? Like how, how, how much would it take? Well, Derek, I've probably had about 600 sessions at this point. Okay. Like Lot, right? <laughs> I, uh, I received a lot from students. I've, I've done a lot of these group sessions because what happened was my personal one-on-one -on -one practice got so busy that I was booking like four or five months out and it was crazy like that, that you can't be a wellness provider and be killing yourself in the process and that's what was happening. It seemed like 25 people a week and then going home and taking care of my kids and you know, it's just like yeah. not in very good shape and needed to do something different and uh, my friend Marcy Shamoff that I was talking to you earlier about, she suggested to me that I try working in groups, you know, and just like doing distance was a stretch. This idea of like doing groups was a stretch too, like group tuning for healing at a distance. Like what sounds weirder than that? You know, I can't think of anything, <laughs> but I, I did a handful of free ones in the beginning and people absolutely gave me feedback. They were like, it felt like you were talking to just me. I felt energy moving in my body. And so this was a much more efficient and affordable way um, for me to deliver this kind of healing to people. And so I've done hundreds of these group sessions on all kinds of topics and they're all here at biofieldtuningstore.com. Um, you know, some people, I mean, I, I, it's something I would ever do. I, I personally would never go lie down and listen to an hour of a tuning fork recording to feel better. I, I just wouldn't do it. I'm surprised I even created them, honestly. Um, but but <laughs> people have and do and love them and swear by them and say that they're really effective. They're really helpful. They're educational. You know, they're a combination of coaching, of education. Remember, I've been in this field for 35 years. I've been inside the souls and hearts and minds of thousands and thousands of people. Like I've I have such a, an observation of the human mind, like a perspective on the human mind that I think most people don't have. And it's afforded me a lot of wisdom, quite frankly, you know, <laughs> seeing like, wow, this person does that. I was like, oh, I do that too. That doesn't really make much sense. That's not very balanced. And so I've, I've been able to, to really learn and, and understand a lot. So, um, so wait, what was your question? It was about the, the distance sessions working. Right? Uh, I was, I was kind of just curious, like um, how many sessions a person yeah. would, would want to have to resolve their full. Right. Okay. So, and I said, I've done like 600, right. And I'm still here on planet earth. Like I haven't ascended or anything like that, but what has, what happens, the, the, the sessions are cumulative. So each one you receive builds on the one before it. And what I have observed is that both I and people that I work with, we become lighter and lighter and lighter, uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, um, more free, less, uh, you know, I don't have any pain. I don't have any health issues at all. You know, I'm 52. I backed out and I had a really stressful life. You know, I, I was in debt and poverty for a long time. Um, I had a lot of low level health issues uh, that were kind of chronic, chronic pain, chronic low level infections. Like I was not in good shape at all. And, um, and since receiving, I mean, it really literally all started to change when I started to train my first students in 2010. 
And so the, the better shape your body's electrical system is, the more you get the noise and resistance out of your electrical system, the more optimization you're going to experience in your physiology. That's all there is to it. Like, so how many, you know, it depends on how old you are. It depends on how much damage <laughs> has been done in your system. Everybody's different and everybody responds differently. You know, I love working with like 17, 18, 19 year olds. All they need is a few sessions and they get like sharp as a tack, clear as a bell, totally reconnected to the truth of who they are. You know, hmm. very powerful. If I work with somebody who's in their 80s, we're going to, it's going to, you know, we're going to need a bunch of sessions to really feel like they're really getting somewhere because patterns are wired very deeply the older we get. Um, I'm thinking of one woman who comes to mind who had depression and, uh, and we, and it completely cleared after just three sessions, you know, other people who've had anxiety disorders, we just did a study actually we did a grant funded study that is getting written up this week, actually the final mm. right submitted for peer review. Uh, we had 15 volunteers each receive one biofield tuning distance session a week over the course of three weeks. They all started with clinical levels of anxiety and they all ended without clinical levels of anxiety. Wow. Across the board markers of a dramatic state shift. Now, this is something I've been observing for decades um, and know, you know, know that it's especially helpful for anxiety. Um, but now we have the scientific data to back that up that will be submitted to peer review. And that's just a feasibility study for a larger study we're going to do this year um, with 60 participants. So, you know, I have a nonprofit institute and we're all about doing the science and going down the channels in all the right ways to advance the science of the biofield. And to speak again to about skeptics, um, I have another website called electrichealth.com where I compiled dozens of journal articles of published studies on the biofield. This is a legitimate field of science. And, um, and also dozens of articles from mainstream publications about the, the electric nature of life. So there's so much information there that there's no way you can argue with any of it. It's very clear that this is also and it's all compiled in one place. So if anybody wants to go check that out, they can. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot there. Um, my uh, my father's actually he's going to be having a biofield tuning session, and he's uh, falls on the sort of skeptical side. He's also a scientist, and um, so I, I just want to appreciate and acknowledge that you're um, you know you're experimenting at the edge, but then you're you know having peer reviewed papers is still the the standard and and. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that you're you're doing that to to make it accessible to to folks in that way. Um, are there are there studies that uh, that you haven't done yet that you're you want to really um, you know do do uh, write a paper on or, or what experiments would you do? There is another study that um, we're going to be going underway with th uh, through Ions, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We're going to partner with them to do a um, to see if the sonic slider tuning fork increases bone density, and we're going to be partnering with a bone density scanning lab in Chicago who's going to recruit low density patients. We're going to put a sonic slider in all their hands, and uh, I have a 21 day series, so where they're going to have them go through the 21 day series twice, get a bone scan at 21 days, and then another bone scan at 42 days to see if using the sonic slider regularly increases bone density, which could be really super cool if it does. I mean, that's my, again, my feeling sense and my observation is that it does with, in the absence of scanning equipment. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of older people who are at home who are hanging out, you know, could be using the sonic slider and could be helping reduce their risk for falls and, you know, just helping them to feel better. The sonic slider has a variety of benefits that it can convey to people. And so uh, I'd like to do more studies with the sonic slider. I think that, you know, that it's a, it's a great tool for introducing vibrational medicine to the masses because you feel instantly better when you start to use it. You notice that you relax right away. You notice you breathe. Many people have discovered it helps to relieve pain and all mm. kinds of stuff. So it's sort of an easy sell, uh, you know, to introduce people into what is possible in the world of, of vibrational medicine. 
Yeah, this is this is so cool. And um, you know, I still have I still have lots of <laughs> lots of notes and places we could go, but I, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, uh, perhaps maybe we could we could say for for people that um, want to think about sort of raising their battery, raising their charge. Uh, if there's, if you were to start thinking electrically, uh, where should people start in terms of how they can improve their health? That's a good question. Well, the first and foremost source of electrical juice that your body runs on does not come from food because you can go, some people go months without food. I'm friends with some people on Facebook that don't eat at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it doesn't come obviously from liquids. We can go days without liquids. You can only go a few minutes without breath. And so this is another kind of way of switching your thinking from thinking chemically to thinking electrically. The oxygen molecule has four free electrons that bind to the hemoglobin in our blood and electromagnetically. And it's these electrons that get dropped off at cells. And so anything that you can do <clears throat> to breathe more deeply, more fully, more freely, more joyfully, more gratefully, more enthusiastically is going to raise your voltage. Mm, it's making me think of, of Wim Hof and his yeah, Wim Hof. Freedom. Totally. Like go follow Wim Hof, you know, <laughs> go, go. There's so many videos There's so many different things you can do, but you know, in the absence of any of that, just notice when you're holding your breath. So many people just hold their breath. They take a breath, you know, the, you're just not breathing regularly, or you might be breathing really shallowly and not fully at all. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the case with a great many people. And so this is what biofield tuning does is it unlocks these subconscious bindings that are limiting your breath. I well, noticed I, in my that, session, um, Jess was saying, okay, now make sure you're breathing or she, she would, I would notice that she was breathing um, at certain moments. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's super key. Like to me, that, that that's the essence of it is unlocking our spirit and and liberating, you know, the, the, the degree of freedom in our breath is reflective of the degree of freedom in our life and in our mind and in our body. Mm. So, so first, and it's free, you know, it's so, so free. <laughs> um, the next thing you can do is hum, tone, chant, sing, that's all free. And that will raise your voltage. Humming especially just creates a vibrational resonance in your bones that makes electricity. Hmm. Hmm. I am thinking of when, when I had uh, kids and I started singing to them at bedtime. Uh, I never sung consistently before. Obviously I'm a podcaster and I'm speaking, but there was something that sort of changed and I never could put a finger on it when I started singing consistently, um, but it was like a level of sort of ease and expression that I hadn't had before. Yeah. Well, you know, singing is a very joyful, it's a very potentially very joyful experience, especially singing with other people. It, it can, you know, if, if you've ever been in a band, uh, there's an, something or an choir or anything like that. There's something about the experience of making music with other people that, that jazzes your cells like nothing else. <laughs> You know, <laughs> liveness goes. I met Herbie Hancock a few years ago, and uh, I knew I knew I was going to meet him. Waiting for him to come across a hotel lobby, and I, I looked on you know Wikipedia is eighty two years old. I'm looking for an old man. He walked past me. I didn't even recognize him. The guy looks fifty. He looks fifty. <laughs> Herbie Hancock is like electrically healthy is a, an incredible example of how music improves and increases our voltage and our health and our longevity. Absolutely. So you're yeah. saying that the jazz could, can jazz up our cells. Yeah. Jazz. I mean, I think any kind of music, any kind of music. <laughs> you know, he played a two hour concert and at the end of it, he pulled out this guitar, right? It's a hybrid keyboard guitar. And he was jumping up and down the stage with it like a 19 year old. <laughs> wow. I I see there with my jaw hanging open. I was like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm going to be like that when I'm his age, you know? So amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you uh, want to make sure people, uh, people know? 
Well, I'd like to let people know that um, we have wonderful biofield tuning practitioners all over the world. Um, that, you know, if you're feeling like, wow, I want to check this out, I'd love to try a session. Uh, don't ask me, <laughs> but, but you can, you know, I've got, I've trained many wonderful people. Everybody's learned how to do it at a distance. And, you know, distance is the only way I receive sessions. Like I got one yesterday. Uh, I don't need an in-person one. I'm absolutely, you know, and sometimes I almost think that the, the distance ones can be more powerful than in-person. Um, because you're just so focused on what's going on. So, so be open-minded to that. Um, and it, there's also, you know, the uh, sessions, the recorded sessions on my website. Um, this is a wonderful practice to learn and to, to give to people because, because it is so helpful. And, and it's a very intimate practice you know if you're a people person and you really do love people and you really do love helping people um this is an efficient effective way to get right into whatever it is that's ailing people and help them pretty quickly and and can and really connect to them to really hear people and really see people and really really help them um so it's a super super gratifying practice to 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 do and we now have full training online um you know, 2020 forced us to go from in-person classes to online. And so as of the summer, we'll have the second stage of our training will be available. So that's an option. And, um, and then also, if you haven't checked out Electric Body, Electric Health, um, I'd love it if you could. Um, you know, there's a lot of cutting edge information in that book that you're probably not going to find anywhere else. Yeah, the um, the the beginning of the book was was very helpful. You you brought a lot of um, research together there, so definitely recommend it. Um, just left you a review this morning on Amazon, and I'm I'm excited to to get a to get a fork myself and start playing around and uh, see yeah. to to really experience it from from the, the end of the holder holder of the fork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's more there. There's a whole store of tools that you know the Fibonacci forks. Um, the sonic slider, uh, the other forks that we use. We have kits. So we sell a little kit that's got instructional videos, all the forks. Like if you want to become a practitioner, um, then you have to start with the kit anyway. And that gives you enough information to get started working on friends and family right away. And you know, people work on their pets and their plants and uh, their parents and their kids. And, uh, you know, it's, it's surprisingly easy to learn. It's not a very complex process at all. And people are always sort of universally surprised and delighted, you know, and they're moving the fork through the field and they find resistance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I, I can imagine that. Yeah. Okay. Very exciting. Uh, Eileen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it's been fantastic. Um, just appreciate that you're doing this work, pushing, pushing boundaries, explaining it, bringing healing to so many people and um, yeah, just keep going. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Derek. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye.